IBT, model test scripts for the listening section. Listen to a conversation between two students. They're talking after class. So, how did you like the lecture? It was okay, I guess. That doesn't sound very enthusiastic. Well, to tell the truth, Dr. Peterson's lectures usually leave me cold. Really? That surprises me. I mean, she's so organized. That's just it. My outline's perfect. No digressions, no interesting asides, just the facts. I might as well read the book and skip the class. What about you? Hmm, that's why I like her lectures, actually. I read the book before class. Then her lecture gives me a really good review of the chapter. In fact, sometimes when I don't have time to read the chapter, I just listen and take notes. Then I、uh, study from. Oh, I see. You. No, no. I usually read the chapters too. I said sometimes. What kind of lecture do you like? Well, something that adds value. I like stories, examples. You know, the kind of thing that makes the material seem more real, like Professor Woods. Exactly. Now I could listen to his lectures any time. Not to mention the fact that he looks so good. That <laughs> doesn't have anything to do with it. Come on, you know that half the class is, half the class has a crush on him. No, no. What I like is how interesting he makes the material. He always brings in pictures and videos, and and that gets me interested. Doctor Peterson might as well read from the book. That's not fair. She's very well prepared, like today. Okay, I'll give you that. She is organized, but Woods is organized too. It's just that that he's more flexible. Hey, professors just have different presentation styles. True, and students have different learning styles too. So、uh, naturally, a student is going to prefer a professor whose presentation style is well, more compatible with that student's learning style. Don't you think? That does make sense. I know I'm a linear thinker, so no kidding. And you aren't. No, I'm more holistic. I'd say, probably more. Well, more of a visual learner. Right. So that proves your theory. Peterson certainly has a linear presentation style. Everything's laid out in lists on the handouts, and Woods does bring in all those visuals. Mm-hmm. I like Professor Jones too. And probably Stanley and Green as well. Yeah, I do. You don't? Too much extra stuff. I don't know. I get confused with all that. I relate to the professors who summarize the material, like Peterson or、uh, Baker. And another thing. Don't forget that Peterson shows up for every lecture, not like some professors who send their TAs to teach their classes. That's not fair. Woods doesn't do that very often. Besides, the TA isn't that bad. No, but but a lot of professors do, especially the ones who are doing a lot of research. But when you sign up for Peterson's class, you know that she's going to teach it. I'll give her that. She does do her own lecturing. But on the other hand, Woods brings his research into the class, and you know that just makes it more interesting, in my opinion. Even if he does have his TA do some of the lectures, um, actually his TA's pretty good, and better than Woods in some ways. Well, to each his own. But even you have to admit that Woods is better than Peterson about answering questions. He's good on his feet, but with Peterson, I don't have that many questions to ask. It's so so straightforward. Like today, no one asked any questions because it was so、uh, clear. And besides, you can just look in the book, which I like. I know. So, are you going to take any more courses with her? Sure. Next semester, I'm going to sign up for the course, her class in child psychology. I probably will too. Really? Yeah. Even though I complain about her, I do learn a lot in her classes, and child psychology would be an interesting elective for my major. And um, and I think she's the only one who teaches it. Great. Then we can study together again if you want to. Okay. That sounds good. Number one. What are the students mainly discussing?
two, what kind of lecture does the woman prefer? Three, why does the man criticize Dr. Woods? Four, what is the woman's attitude toward Dr. Woods? Five. What will the woman most probably do? Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Hi, Professor Walters. Hi, Jan. How are you doing? Great, thanks. How are you? Just fine. What can I do for you? Well, um. I'd really appreciate your help with my scholarship application. Oh, good. I'm glad you applied. Oh, wait. That deadline is the end of next week, isn't it? It's, it's this Friday, but I have everything done on the computer, so um, any changes will be easy to fix, and um, it shouldn't take long to finish it up. Okay. Actually, the main problem I'm having is with. I'm not sure my essay is what they're looking for. You know. I find it a little embarrassing to, well, to tell them what a great person I am, if you know what I mean. Have you written anything yet? Just an outline. Here it is. Okay, but before I look at this, do you have the directions for the application, or better yet, for the essay? Yeah, right here. I have the、um, instructions for the application right here. Let me see that first, because the committee usually wants has some specific points that they're looking for. This is sponsored by a private donor, as I recall, and it's open only to women who are seniors in the College of Business. Right, and I'll be a senior next year, so it's it would be perfect. But there have to be some more、uh, more specific requirements here somewhere. Oh, here we are. Look at this. They want to know about your personal background. Then they want you to tell them about、uh, the first three years of your college education, and and last, they want specifics about your goals. Uh oh. Well, I didn't do this right then. Hmm. I just wrote why I needed the scholarship. And that may be okay for the part about your college education, or、uh, you might even be able to put it in with the part about your goals.、Uh, But I can assure you that you'll lose points if you don't follow these directions and write. It appears to me they want a three-part essay: personal background, college education, and goals. Listen, I've been involved in quite a few scholarship committees, and in order to be as as fair as possible, we all read the applications and assign points to them. Usually, one hundred. Just because it's easy to figure up, but anyway, there will be a certain number of points for the essay, and because this almost has to be a three-part essay,、um, you'll probably get one third of the points for each part. So, if you don't write about your personal background, for example,、uh, you'll lose one third of the points for the essay, and that、uh, that could mean the difference between being in the final group that gets called in for an interview or not moving into the final group at all. Wow. I almost blew it. I'd better go back and rewrite this, Professor Walters. Um, could you possibly give me another appointment before Friday? I mean, so I can show you my essay, my new essay. Sure, Jan. But the sooner the better. Even if the committee doesn't meet for a month, what usually happens is the secretary will stamp a date on every application packet. And、uh, any packets with dates after the deadline, those will be eliminated first. There will probably be over a hundred applications. I'm just guessing here, but there will be a lot of them. And using the date as the first screening is is pretty common. Well, it's only three paragraphs, so I could have that done by tomorrow. But, but I don't know if you could see me then. Tomorrow's fine. I'll be here between one and three. Great. When you don't need an appointment, I'll see you when you get here. Thanks so much, Doctor Walters. That's so great. 
No problem. I can see from the way that you have your application prepared that、uh, I can tell you've taken a lot of time to work on this. Besides that, Jan, you're an excellent student. Your grade point average is what? A 4.0? So far, I have all A's. See what I'm saying? I think you're a good candidate for this scholarship, and I'd like to see you give it your best shot. Thanks. And Jan, that part about being embarrassed to tell the committee how good you are. Pretend you're writing this essay about your best friend. You're good friends with Kathy, right? She's my best friend for sure. Well, then pretend you're writing this essay about her. Just use the information about you when you do it. Okay? Okay. Like you said, I'm going to give it my best shot. Six. Why does the student go to see the professor? Seven. What information is required in the essay? Eight. When does the woman need to turn in her application to the committee? Nine. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Your grade point average is what? A four point zero? So far, I have all A's. See what I'm saying? Why does the professor say this? Your grade point average is what? A four point zero? Ten. Why does Professor Walters tell the woman to pretend she is writing about her friend Kathy? Listen to part of a discussion in a sociology class. The professor is talking about the internet. I'm sure if I asked you, everyone present would respond positively to the question. Do you use the internet? I know this because the use of the internet among college students is almost 100 percent. We shop on the computer, we learn on the computer, we're entertained on the computer, and more and more we use the computer as a primary means of communication, not only with the business associates but also with friends and family. Chat rooms are becoming more and more popular, and、uh, and listservs connect people from around the world with the information that's important to their group. We even find our prospective mates by using the internet. So the question is, what effect does the internet have on social interaction? Any ideas? Well, from what you said, I think it would be a very positive influence. Me too. I mean, in my case, I write emails to my family because it's just so easy to jump from what I'm doing in school, a paper or something, to the email program, and you know, write a few lines to my sister. I'd never take the time to write her a letter, buy a stamp, take it to the post office, you know. Right. Maybe, but a lot of people aren't using the net to talk to family or friends. It's a more superficial thing. Well, more of a way to communicate anonymously with、uh, with strangers. Half the time, they aren't even using their real names. That's true. Besides, what about all the time people spend playing computer games alone instead of doing something with another person? Good observations on both sides. And basically, you've brought out the arguments that have been made for and against internet use. Some people think that the computer facilitates social interaction, and others feel that it impedes it. So, to find the answer, to investigate how internet use affects social relationships, a team of psychologists at Carnegie Mellon University they conducted a longitudinal study of internet users. More than 150 people were monitored for one to two years. The subjects were recruited from among people who hadn't used the internet previously. In exchange for their participation, they received a computer, free software, a free phone line, and internet hookup. Before they began using their computers, they were assessed for mental health and、uh, social well-being.
After an extended period of internet use, the team found that time on the computer was、uh, it was detrimental to both mental health and social well-being. In fact, increased use of the internet correlated with less communication among family members and friends in the local area. Also interesting was the incidence of. The highest users reported increased loneliness and a higher degree of depression. Hmm. So why did that happen? Do they think? What do you think? Disappointment, maybe. Go on. Well, maybe they expected too much from their internet friends. I mean, if you think that a person you meet on the internet is going to be your special someone, that probably isn't going to happen. Someone who has internet friends probably enjoys that and probably has a lot of of relationships on the net. Or they may be neglecting important friendships while they spend time online, and later, well, they may find that they are damaging those those relationships. Both of those ideas sound reasonable. The researchers put it this way: the relationships on the internet were weak. Example: you might exchange recipes with someone online through a website, but that person won't probably won't offer help and support when you need it. At least, not like some of the friends that you might make at school, work, church, or in your community. So, when you say you shouldn't expect too much from an internet friend, that's、uh, that's good advice, Nancy. And Rob, when you say that important friendships could be neglected, that's part of the picture too. But do you see anything about the findings that we should question? Well, everybody doesn't use the internet for the same purposes. So, um. Maybe how the internet is being used, they should probably look at that. Good point. Anything else? Some people aren't going to make those other kinds of friendships anyway. So, you know, the internet at least allows them to have some social interaction. That seems reasonable too, especially in the case of isolated living situations like、uh, rural areas where there might not be many face-to-face -face resources. I'd also like to point out that we need more research to draw conclusions because this was only one study. Eleven. What is the purpose of this lecture? Twelve. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. What do you think? Disappointment, maybe. Go on. Well, maybe they expected too much from their internet friends. I mean, if you think that a person you meet on the internet is going to be your special someone, that probably isn't going to happen. Why does the professor say this? Go on. Thirteen. What were the results of the research study? Fourteen. The professor gives an example of a person who exchanges recipes with someone on the internet. What does this example demonstrate? Fifteen. Why does the professor question the results of the research? Sixteen. What is the attitude of the professor toward the students? Listen to part of a class discussion in a business management class. First, let me say that managing success requires a certain set of managing skills, and we're usually focusing on how to be successful managers. But it's also、um, inevitable that all managers will have to deal with failure, their own or their staffs, or the people they have delegated responsibility to. I assume that you've all read the case study for the Anderson Company. That's on page three forty-seven of your textbook. So, let's summarize that study and use it for the、uh, our discussion on how to manage failure. 
Because believe me, as a manager, you must be able to identify and intervene when mistakes occur. Okay, back to the Anderson Company. What happened? Well, first of all, the Anderson Company was a distributor for office supplies, and they lost money because they they underbid a job for a client, an important client. So that was the mistake they made. Right. And why did they underbid? Anyone? I don't have my book here, but I think I remember it. There was a large order for furniture, wasn't it? Office furniture. So there was a large order, which was good. But somehow there wasn't any charge in the estimate for assembly of the furniture, so the client expected delivery of desks and chairs, and I think filing cabinets ready to go, completely assembled. But um, there wasn't any cost figured in for the labor. It was a fairly large figure too, maybe three thousand dollars. Thanks, Anne. That's it in a nutshell. So what was the manager's response when the problem became known? Well, at first, everybody started pointing fingers at everybody else, and no one was taking responsibility. But then、uh, the manager called a meeting, and and he said he wanted explanations, not excuses. I remember that line because I wrote it down. I thought it was really good. And he said that the problem wasn't that something had gone wrong; it was that the cause,、um, the reason why the mistake happened. That was what was important because that meant that they could make the same mistake twice. So, how did the manager handle the meeting? Do you recall? Oh yeah, that was good too. He was really calm and not angry at all, and、um, he said that every mistake was a result of an error in the company, not the employees. So the company needed to be modified so the mistake wouldn't happen again. And he told everyone at the meeting that it wasn't his intention to punish anyone for the mistake unless there was an effort to cover it up. So the manager's position was to depersonalize the failure and try to prevent it from happening again. Exactly. Okay. Then what happened, Joe? Um. Well, the salesperson who sold the furniture recognized that he forgot to mention the、uh, the agreement to assemble the furniture before delivery. He forgot that when he gave the order to the account supervisor, but it was written on the order. Anyway, he ended up taking some responsibility because it was an unusual request, and he thought he should have maybe pointed it out. Then the account supervisor admitted that she'd gone through the order very quickly, and、uh, and she hadn't seen the word assembled on the order, so she didn't figure in the cost when she sent the bid. So once the guilty parties were found, what did the manager do? I remember that part. He didn't focus on the error at all. He went directly to brainstorming a procedure that would prevent the same error from being made in the future. And they came up with asking the sales team to identify each furniture order as assembly required or no assembly required after each item. And the account supervisor, she was asked to be alert to the instruction on each order, so so she could factor in the cost on the bids. Okay, what do you think about the manager's style? Well, I was surprised that he called that it was an open meeting. I mean to resolve the problem. I would have thought that he might have just talked with the people who made the mistake, you know, privately. That occurred to me too when I read the case study. But then I was thinking, he was probably running into so many excuses that he needed to just bring it out into the open. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I think he was also trying to demonstrate that the company procedures were the problem, not just the employees who had made the error. Do you think that the employees should have been reprimanded? After all, the mistake could have been avoided, couldn't it? Sure, sure. The mistake shouldn't have happened, but I think the manager. I think he probably gained more in terms of what do you call it? Team building. Probably there was more of a willingness on the part of the employees to come up with positive changes in the procedure too. I mean, I think that was more valuable than the three thousand dollars, and he wouldn't have accomplished that by calling in employees privately to give them a reprimand. Okay. And it turned out fine because the people responsible stepped up and accepted their responsibility. But what if they hadn't done that? What do you think the manager would have done in that case? I think he would have been very firm about concealing the mistake, and he, 
I think he probably would have acted very differently. You mean he would have reprimanded them in some way? I think he would have. Seventeen. What is the class mainly discussing? Eighteen. Listen again to part of the discussion, then answer the question. Right. And why did they underbid? Anyone? Why does the professor say this? Anyone? Nineteen. What does the professor mean when she says this? That's it in a nutshell. Twenty. How did the mistake occur? Twenty-one. Based on information in the lecture, indicate whether the statements refer to the way that the manager responded to the error. Twenty-two. What conclusion did the students make about the management style? Listen to part of a lecture in an environmental science class. Today, I'd like to introduce the topic of integrated pest management. Now, unlike the previous methods that、uh, relied on on pesticides alone, integrated pest management requires a complete analysis of the ecology of the crop, which pests it might be susceptible to, how the pests interact with parasites or predators. How the climate affects the pests, and and how beneficial insects can be、uh, encouraged. It's also important to to understand the points of vulnerability and the life cycles of pests. Now, reproduction is especially important, as you can imagine, because because if you can reduce the number of new pests, then the population will be dramatically affected. I'm talking about during the next crop season, for example. During the mating stage of some species of moths, a chemical called a pheromone, pheromone spelled with a p h, so a pheromone is released by females to attract males. Believe it or not, the males can detect pheromones from well as far away as two miles. That's nearly three kilometers. So spraying an area with a pheromone or something synthetic like a pheromone that confuses the males, that makes them. They are unsuccessful finding females to mate with, and and the moth population the following year is greatly reduced. So there are fewer pests to deal with. Of course, another option is to is male sterilization, which has been very effective, especially with certain varieties of flies. The screwworm fly can actually kill large grazing animals like cattle or goats, but since the female mates only once in her life cycle. The population can be controlled by、uh, developing sterile males, and they do this in in lab settings, and then they release them into the environment. So, as you can see, manipulating the reproductive cycles is one very good way to manage pests. Now, another management strategy is to use a predator to control the pests. Most of you are familiar with the ladybug. But you may not know that the ladybug is a natural predator of aphids, and aphids attack citrus trees and reduce crop yields. So, by increasing the ladybug population, the aphid population it naturally decreases, and ladybugs aren't harmful to other plants. Okay, I should mention that the definition of a pest extends to vegetation. Weeds are pests too, and they can be controlled effectively by introducing predators as well.、Uh, the criteria are a little bit tricky, though, since weeds are plants, and、uh, 
It's important to find a predator that attacks the weeds, but it doesn't like the crop, so it leaves the plant crop alone. But it can be done, like the case of several species of beetles that feed on a wetlands weed called purple loosestrife. The problem is the loosestrife crowds out cattails and other native vegetation in the wetlands ecosystem. So the beetles are introduced, and they reduce the loosestrife. Don't quote me on this, but I think it is as much as ninety percent in some areas. So that brings us to the use of bacteria to kill pests, which I'll just mention briefly. One example of an effective intervention is the introduction of Bacillus thuringiensis. Let me write that on the board for you, Bacillus thuringiensis, which releases a toxin that destroys large populations of mosquitoes and caterpillars. And is especially efficient in ridding crop areas of the caterpillars that become adult leaf-eating moths. Actually, the modification of farming practices can make a a huge difference in pest management. For one thing, there are some naturally occurring pesticides in plants. Marigolds control soil nematodes, and、uh, garlic controls some species of beetles. So you see, planting these crops along with another crop that needs protection can、uh, really help. Another thing, destroying crop residues by plowing them under that eliminates an environment where pests may live during the winter, and they die out. So there aren't as many, and that reduces the need for insecticides in the spring. Oh yes, the old practice of crop rotation has become popular again too, because it prevents a buildup of the same pests year after year. But、uh, the latest strategy in pest management. Involves the genetic modification of the plants themselves. Now, in the next decade, we hope to be able to to engineer high yield plant varieties, and、uh, they'll be much more resistant to insects and diseases. Although this is a simplification, in general, generic engineering. Did I say generic? Genetic engineering. That's genetic engineering. Involves the insertion of genes from other species. Into crop plants in order to develop beneficial traits. One example that is very exciting is the insertion of bacterial genes, and these genes will support the plant's production of a natural、uh, pesticide that the pesticide will protect it against its primary pest. And in another successful project, genes are being inserted to to protect the crop from the pesticides that are used to control weeds. So that could be a real breakthrough. Of course, there are ethical considerations and cost-effectiveness issues. In fact,、uh, some countries won't import genetically engineered plants because there are still so many unknowns. Can we really know the result to the total ecosystem that the introduction of a biotechnologically engineered plant will cause? In any case. You can see that there are a number of alternatives for integrated pest management, including pesticides, but also using intervention in the reproductive cycle, the introduction of natural predators, substitution of bacteria for pesticides, modification of farming practices, and and even genetic modification of the plants themselves. Most management plans will, in fact, use a number of these strategies for、uh, in a complete plan. Twenty-three. What is this lecture mainly about? Twenty-four. According to the professor, what are pheromones? Twenty-five. Why does the professor mention the example of ladybugs? Twenty-six. Which changes in farming practices support pest management? Twenty-seven. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. 
Although this is a simplification, in general, generic engineering... Did I say generic? Genetic engineering, that's genetic engineering, involves the insertion of genes from other species into crop plants in order to develop beneficial traits. Why does the professor ask the following question? Did I say generic? Twenty-eight. What does the professor imply about genetic modification of plants? Listen to part of a lecture in an art history class. The arts and crafts movement was a reaction to the mass production of the industrial period. It began at the very end of the 19th century, but it's generally considered a 20th century movement. And really, there's no clear end to it. In fact, arguably, there's still evidence of an arts and crafts school today. So, what identifies arts and crafts? I'm going to talk about four characteristics. Quality, simplicity, comfort, and hand craftsmanship. But to, to really understand the philosophy, and it is a philosophy, we should compare all of those characteristics with the qualities from the Victorian age that preceded the arts and crafts movement. As you recall from our study of the Victorians, theirs was an age of quantity. That is to say, every surface was covered with pictures, ornaments, and objects. Also, the Victorians were noted for extravagance and uh, even excess in decoration. And they were impressed by the new machine reproductions that were being mass-produced uh, at reasonable prices. Finally, don't forget that style and show were more important to them than comfort. And by that, I mean the Victorians were more interested in, in impressing the guests that came to call them than uh, making them comfortable. Now, with that in mind, let's go back and compare the Victorians with the arts and crafts artisans that came after them. One, quality instead of quantity. In other words, the arts and crafts artisans thought that it was better to have a few fine objects than, than a clutter of objects that were less valuable. Two, simplicity instead of excess. A room decorated in the arts and crafts style would have looked... Well, people who were accustomed to Victorian opulence would probably have thought it was quite bare. Simple lines replaced the carvings that, that seemed to cover every inch of furniture and architectural ornamentation in Victorian homes. Three, comfort instead of display. And this was especially evident in the arts and crafts chairs that were uh, uh, softly padded with leather cushions and rounded edges. The Victorian chairs were more like, well, really like tiny thrones and were built for people to perch on. But the arts and crafts chairs were practical, big and roomy. You could sink into the chairs. And the rest of the furniture was also practical with with clean lines and comfort built in. The uh, Eastwood chair comes to mind. Although Gustav Stickley was also producing chairs in a mission style that's still popular today. And, and that's what I meant about not having a clear end to the movement since it's still an alternative for decorative arts today. Okay, how did the movement begin? Well, the Industrial Age caused a reaction among artists in many places but William Morris in England was certainly in the forefront, along with Albert Hubbard, who Hubbard founded the East Aurora Workshop. The East Aurora motto was hand, head, and heart, which probably sums up the movement as well, and, and concisely as anything. Originally, the workshop was a group of 50 artisans living in a community, and they followed the tradition of medieval craftsmen, although they used machines as tools for their crafts. I think they were probably best known for hand-bound books. But the East Aurora Workshop also produced uh, pieces of hammered metalwork and, and furniture, primarily oak and chestnut furniture. Remember that model? 
hand, head, and heart. Well, according to Hubbard, if you love the work and work with integrity, the rest will follow. So that was his way of living the motto. In 1914, oh, sorry, 1915, that was the date when Hubbard died and the community dispersed. But almost 100 years later, the pieces of Roy Croft furniture that they produced there are highly prized. So let's see, what was happening in the outside world? Farmers were moving to the cities to work in factories, and there was an, an expansion of the middle class. The Victorian homes were too expensive, too ornate, and the arts and crafts bungalow home emerged as the affordable, well-constructed alternative to uh, the castle-like mansions of the Victorian era. Bungalows were charming, homey, and affordable. They often had open living and dining areas that gave a more spacious feel to a smaller space, and built-in cabinets that uh, reduced the need to buy furniture. The front porches became outdoor rooms with simple, comfortable tables and chairs. Instead of the Victorian facade that was built to impress the neighbors, the porch was, was unadorned but welcoming. In many ways, these bungalows became the standard for middle-class neighborhoods. But when we look at them today, they're impressive in their own way. The workmanship, in many cases, is just superb. The wood beams and natural wood floors, the fireplaces and the cabinetry are, let's say, unpretentious but exquisitely crafted. And the tile work should also be mentioned. The name to remember for tile is Henry Chapman Mercer, who founded the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works in Pennsylvania. While working with apprentices, he supervised every piece and they decorated them all by hand. The maker was part of the product and often signed the tiles. I guess what strikes me as an art historian about the arts and crafts movement is the fact that the designs are so timeless. Van Briggle Pottery, for example, was founded in Colorado Springs almost 100 years ago by artist Van Briggle, who demanded that the function of pottery, uh, the utility, be combined with the art. Van Briggle created designs that were shaped to resemble sculptures, and then he developed a unique glaze that came out of the firing with a matte finish, which was really new, since the pottery of the time was uh, very highly polished. But my point is that the Van Briggle Pottery Works continues to operate today, using those original designs. That's what I mean by timeless. 29. What is the professor mainly discussing? Thirty. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. As you recall from our study of the Victorians, theirs was an age of quantity. That is to say, every surface was covered with pictures ornaments and objects. Also, the Victorians were noted for extravagance and uh, even excess in decoration. Why does the professor say this? As you recall from our study of the Victorians, theirs was an age of quantity. 31. What are two design elements of arts and crafts chairs? 32. What did the motto, hand, head, and heart, mean? 33. According to the professor, why did the arts and crafts bungalows become so popular? 34. Why did the professor use the example of the Van Briggle Pottery Works? 
IBT, Model Test Scripts for the Speaking Section. This is the speaking section of the TOEFL Model Test. During the test, you will respond to six speaking questions. You may take notes as you listen. The reading passages and the questions are printed in the book, but most of the directions will be spoken. Number one, listen for a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. What are the qualities of a good neighbor? Explain why you think these qualities are important. Be sure to include specific examples and details in your answer. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number two, listen for a question that asks your opinion about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have fifteen seconds to prepare and forty-five seconds to record your answer. Some people feel that it is important to be on time for every meeting, whether it is a business appointment or a party with friends. Other people feel that being on time is important only for business and professional appointments, but social occasions do not require that the participants arrive on time. Which approach do you think is better, and why? Be sure to use specific reasons and examples to support your opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number three, read a short passage and then listen to a talk on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have thirty seconds to prepare and sixty seconds to record your answer. The administration at State University recognizes that there are not enough parking spaces for commuter students. Read the notice from a poster on campus. You have forty-five seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now.
Now listen to a student who is speaking at the open meeting. He is expressing his opinion about the parking problem. I understand that there are good reasons to use public transportation, but for many of us, it just isn't practical. If you look at the number of married students with children, you'll see that there are quite a few who have to take children to school, go to work, and then come to campus. And it wouldn't be very convenient to try to do all that by bus. Besides, a lot of times I stay really late at the library, but the public buses stop running at nine. And to tell the truth, I don't think students will use the buses, so the parking problem won't be solved anyway. The student expresses his opinion about the university's plans for improving the parking situation at State University. Report his opinion and explain the reasons that he gives for having that opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number four. Read a short passage and then listen to a lecture on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have thirty seconds to prepare and sixty seconds to record your answer. Now read the passage about land use planning. You have forty-five seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture in an environmental science class. The professor is talking about a land use problem. Recently, there was an opportunity for a recreational area to be established on public land in Arizona, with funding from a large private benefactor. But the area had traditionally been used for ranching. It seems that a special use permit had been granted to several large ranchers who had been grazing cattle on the land for years. So the problem for the land use committee was how to resolve the dispute. On the one hand, public sentiment favored using public land for recreation that would benefit the community. On the other hand, the permits had been issued, and the ranchers were influential and politically well connected. One obvious solution was to designate the public land for a particular type of use, and to locate a similar area nearby for the other purpose. But the committee decided to allow the recreational area to be established on the rangeland, and to continue to grant range rights to the ranchers. Although the ranchers resented the intrusion of the hikers and campers, 
and the people who participated in recreational activities were not happy about the herds of cattle on what they considered a wilderness area, the committee was firm about the shared use. Explain what the Land Use Committee believed to be the problem in their area and what they recommended to solve it. Explain how their decision reflects the fundamental principles of land use planning. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number five, listen to a short conversation, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to a conversation between a student and her advisor. I've been looking for information about scholarships, but so far I haven't found anything for foreign students. You see, I'm from Canada. Well, I'm not surprised about the scholarship situation. Unfortunately, the university offers very little in the way of financial support for non-resident students. I would say that about 80% of the scholarships go to in-state residents. You know, students who graduated from high schools in this state. What about the other 20%? Scholarships for specific fields of study. But most of them are restricted to citizens of the U.S. What's your major? It's engineering. Engineering. Well, you might qualify for the Williams Memorial Scholarship. Mr. Williams was a successful engineer in Chicago, and his family arranged for a scholarship in his name. It's highly competitive, but there are no restrictions on nationality. How are your grades? I have a 3.9. Well, that's good enough to try for it. But if that doesn't work out, have you considered work-study? You could work 20 hours a week. It's usually office work, although occasionally there are jobs in the library. Can I do that on a student visa? I don't have a work permit. That's okay. You're allowed to work part-time as long as it's on campus. Describe the woman's problem and the two suggestions that her advisor makes about how to handle it. What do you think the woman should do and why? Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number six. Listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have twenty seconds to prepare, and sixty seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. The professor is discussing X-rays. Okay, let's review what we talked about yesterday. About X-rays, I mean. Remember, X-rays are electromagnetic waves that range in wavelength from as large as 100 nanometers to as small as 0.1 nanometers. That's smaller than an atom. But these waves, though small, have a very high frequency and consequently a very high energy output. So X-rays can penetrate several centimeters into most objects. But what makes X-rays really important is the fact that they are absorbed by varying degrees, right? This property is why X-rays are commonly used in medical science to capture visual images of the skeleton and organs in the human body, because bones and teeth absorb X-rays more efficiently than soft tissues like skin or muscle, and well, a detailed picture of the internal organs can be formed in an image. Another very important function of X-rays is to make images of manufactured structures and industries where welded parts are joined. Using X-rays, it's possible to locate defects and correct them as part of the inspection process. Again, because materials will absorb the X-rays in varying degrees. The transportation industry relies heavily on this technology to inspect automobiles and aircraft. And X-ray scanners are standard equipment for security, as, for example, in the machines at airports that check the contents of baggage. Other possibilities for X-rays are being explored in atomic research. As more powerful X-rays are developed, we believe that it'll be possible to use beams to study the exact position of atoms in something as small and delicate as a crystal. Then we'll be able to explore the properties of matter. With much greater precision. Referring to the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the properties that make X-rays useful. Then describe the specific purposes of X-rays that the professor presents. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. IBT model test scripts for the writing section. Integrated writing, the Mozart effect. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic as the passage that you have just read. Now that you've read the article on the Mozart effect, here are a few thoughts for your consideration. Let me say that although the research on the effect of exposure to music or actual training in music is very interesting, and、uh, I agree that this line of investigation should be continued, I think that we need to look more closely at, at three aspects of these studies. First, it's being conducted by a limited number of researchers. And I understand that this is happening in part because it takes a degree of musical expertise to accomplish and interpret these kinds of studies. 
But it would be much more convincing if a larger number of researchers were making contributions to the work. That way, the studies wouldn't cite previous studies by the same investigators. Second, the research has been used to to make a case for music education in schools. As you probably already know, both music and art have been removed from the curriculum in many schools because of budget cuts, and、um, the way that the research has been presented. Outside of the academic community, has often been less than scientific. I mean, even if you agree that music is important to children, as I do, it doesn't follow that the results of these studies conclude that the music programs should be reinstated. In defense of the researchers, let me mention that some of the general interest magazines and newspapers summed up their reports with conclusions. That the original researchers did not put forward. Okay, third, an entire industry has grown up around the Mozart effect. Children's publishers have come out with a number of products that claim to make babies smarter. Audio tapes and toys with classical music cues are becoming popular among parents who want to give their children an intellectual advantage before they begin school. So it seems to me that the rush to sell the idea to parents muddies the water, because the toy companies interject the research into advertising copy in such a way that the ad itself. Appears to be a legitimate conclusion of the study cited. You see, we just don't have very much information about the way the brain processes music. We may be able to conclude that there's some benefit, the so-called Mozart effect, but how does that happen? We do know quite a lot about the way that the human brain processes language, and and when we get to that point in our understanding of music. Then the explanations that are currently so speculative in the music research will be more convincing, and then any programs and products developed will be more valuable. This is the end of the audio practice exercises for the TOEFL sixth edition. Now listen to a message from Dr. Sharp. Hello. At the beginning of this book, I advised you to develop and maintain a positive attitude. I hope you took my advice, because I am sure that it will help you succeed on the TOEFL. This is the affirmation I asked you to repeat. Now repeat it with me. I know more today than I did yesterday. I am preparing. I will succeed. Best wishes on the TOEFL and after the TOEFL. Goodbye for now.